Hi everyone, and welcome to the fourth and final science seminar for the 2020 Kings Park Festival. My name is Russell Miller, and I'm a research scientist at Kings Park and Botanic Garden. Today I'm going to talk about fire and Banksy woodlands and the research that we're doing at Kings Park to understand the effects of different fire regimes on our native flora. First, I'd like to acknowledge the elders, past, present and emerging of the Wadjuk Noonar people as the traditional custodians of the land on which this webinar has been hosted and on which much of my research has been conducted. This is a pre-recorded talk and unfortunately I'm not available to answer questions right now, but if you do have any questions, you can email me directly on the email address that's on your screen now, or you can click on the Q&A button in this webinar. That's the button to the right with the question mark. You can type in your question here, and these will be recorded and sent to me. Keep an eye out on Kings Park and Botanic Garden's social media pages where I'll post my response. So, let's get into talking about fire regimes and Banksy woodlands. The fire regime is one of the most fundamental concepts of fire ecology. The fire regime describes the pattern of fire frequency, severity, intensity, size, and seasonality at any location and determines the impact that fire has on plants. As a response to the fire regimes that plants have experienced throughout their evolutionary history, many species have developed traits or strategies to cope with fire. We can generally characterize these strategies as either re-sprouting or obligate seeding, based on whether established plants have the ability to survive fire or not. Re-sprouts have developed ways to protect growing buds, either under thick bark, such as many eucalypts, or in the soil, such as plants that have developed lignin tubers. After fire, these plants can re-sprout from these protective buds. Obligate cedars, on the other hand, are killed by fire and rely on seeds to recover. About a quarter of banks of woodland plant species are considered obligate cedars. Within both the re-sprouting and obligate seeding classifications, species can develop soil or canopy seed banks. Here, serotony is the term we use to describe plants with canopy stored seed banks, such as many banksias. Species that develop a soil seed bank often have some form of seed dormancy to help time germination to coincide with the environment following fire, where light, water, and nutrients are more available because fire has helped to cycle many of the nutrients held in plants back into the soil and because vegetation is more open and there is less competition for those available nutrients. So our different plant species have different strategies to cope with fire, we can use a common approach to understand how they might be affected by different fire regimes. Much like we can look at population numbers, age distributions, and birth and death rates of human populations to predict how they might change in the future, we can also look at these same characteristics for plant populations to study how different environmental factors, such as fire, might affect them. One of the key aspects of plant demography is understanding how populations are made up of adult plants, seedlings, and seed banks. By seeing how this changes over time, or under different experimental treatments, we can begin to understand the effects of different fire regimes. By looking at the plant demography of species with different traits, such as re-sprouters and opposite cedars, we can also begin to understand how different species might respond to the same fire regime. For example, re-sprouters have the ability to spy fire, and may, many may also recruit new seedlings after fire, whereas obligate cedars are often killed by fire and have abundant post-fire recruitment and may experience different population dynamics to co-occurring re-sprouters. Using the concept of plant demography provides us with a set of key demographic population processes that we can study to begin to piece together the effects of different fire regimes. The processes that we focus on in our research range from those affecting the survival and reproduction of adult plants, the processes affecting seeds and their germination cues, and those affecting seedling survival and establishment. So much of our fire ecology research here at Kings Park is focused on the Banksy woodlands on the Swan Coastal Plain. These woodlands are amazing to work in. They've got very high floral diversity, meaning they're always seeing something new each time we go into the bushland. And a key feature of these Banksy woodlands is they experience a Mediterranean type climate, just like the rest of the southwest of Western Australia. These climates are characterised by cool, wet winters and hot, dry summers. And because they experience this seasonal drought in summer, 
that are highly fire prone and fire is a key ecological disturbance. But unfortunately, Banksy woodlands are in decline. It is estimated that 60% of the original Banksy woodland distribution has been cleared and the remaining woodlands are highly fragmented with most patches now quite small. These factors, along with other ongoing threats, resulted in Banksy Woodlands being listed as a nationally threatened ecological community in 2016. Some of the major ongoing threats for Banksy Woodlands include fire regime change, dieback disease, invasive species, both plants and animals, climate change and hydrological change. In the national listing of Banksy Woodlands, it was recommended that fires must be managed to ensure that where possible, Prevailing fire regimes do not disrupt the life cycles by the component species of the ecological community. While this is a great recommendation, we probably don't know enough about the life cycles and demography of many species to be able to define which fire regimes are detrimental or not. This is where much of our research plays a role for native plant species. A few of the research questions that we have an ongoing focus on include how does the length of the fire interval or the time between fires affect plant populations and plant community composition? How does fire intensity affect soil sea banks? How does fire seasonality affect post-fire population recovery? And how do grassy weeds affect fuels and native species recovery? Some of my PhD research looked at the issue of fire interval effects in detail. Studying fire intervals directly can be a challenge because it can be logistically difficult to impose particular fire regimes on the landscape. But instead, I took an approach to study how populations change with increasing time since fire, which can give us an idea of how they might respond to different fire intervals. I selected sites with different times since fire and recorded plant sizes, flower counts, and for the Sorocco species, those with canopy seed banks, I also recorded woody fruit and cone counts. These measurements allowed me to build a picture of how populations might change in the absence of fire. One aspect I looked at was how long after fire plants would need to begin flowering and reproducing again. We call this the juvenile period. This figure here shows data for the juvenile period of some key woody shrub and tree species that I studied in Banksy Woodlands split up by the fire response types, obligate cedars or reef sprouts. This shows that even the fire killed species that have to grow from seedlings after fire return to flowering within a few years after fire. The part of this story that we're still working on is whether this flowering translates directly to seed production, with seeds being the ultimate measure of whether populations can recover after fire. Another aspect that I looked at is how population size distributions change with increasing time since last fire. Here, size is a proxy for plant age, and it can help us predict if populations are at risk of decline. These figures show the size distributions of two fire killed shrubs according to the time since the last fire. The height of each bar represents the abundance of the size class, and the lines show a smooth trend on these distributions. The figure on the right, the white bars represent seedlings and the gray bars represent juvenile or adult plants. The size distributions on the left are for a fire killed shrub from Eastern Australia and the ones on the right are for one of the species that I studied in my PhD in Banksy Woodlands. The size distributions for Hakea de Currens on the left show what we would normally expect for a fire killed shrub, where populations recover from small seedlings after fire and progressively grow larger as the time since the last fire increases. Normally, we only see seedlings in the post-fire environment because that's when they're normally able to emerge and survive. But what we're seeing on the right from the got below beam in Banksy Woodlands is less clear cut. While there is certainly a seedling peak in the younger sites, suggesting that post-fire recruitment is abundant, there are also seedlings at other age sites suggesting that seedling recruitment can also happen without fire, something that we don't normally see from fire-prone environments. If we looked at the older site for Hakea de Currens, we might see that populations would eventually decline or even disappear as adult plants reach the end of their lifespan 
and there is no new recruitment to replace them. But for the gonfalobium on the right, we don't see this disappearance because they are constantly recruiting new individuals and replacing any adult mortality. Another part of our research is looking at the effects of different fire seasonality or fires at different times of the year. For my PhD, I ran an experiment where I sowed seeds each month from late autumn to mid spring to try to replicate what might happen following fires at these different times. These times are typically when managed fires or prescribed burns occur and where fires might occur more often under climate change in the future. After seed sowing, I recorded seedling emergence for each species and the survival of seedlings over summer. In the second year of the experiment, I also recorded if any new seedlings emerged from seeds that missed the opportunity to germinate in the first year. For this experiment, I focused on several species covering different fire response types to help to provide some information how species might respond across the whole plant community. This figure shows what we found for seedling emergence according to the month of seed sowing. On the y-axis is a proportion of sowing seeds that emerge as seedlings, and on the x-axis is the month in which they were sown. On the left panel, we see seedling emergence from the first year of the study. It's pretty clear that seeds sown in the first half of the experiment, corresponding to late autumn to early winter, had the highest emergence in the first year, because they were queued to germinate at the start of winter rains. The low emergence from the later plantings in late winter and spring probably means that these seeds miss their opportunity to germinate right after they were sown and would have to wait for the next winter to attempt germination. However, we see on the right panel that seed emergence for these later plantings, August to October, was minimal even in the second year. To see why the later plantings might have failed, we also tracked the survival of seeds that failed to germinate after sowing and sat on the soil surface over summer. The y-axis of this figure shows a proportion of these seeds that survived, and the x-axis is the number of months that the seeds were exposed over summer. Here we see that the longer the seeds are exposed, the lower their survival, probably due to the longer exposure to high soil temperatures over summer or to seed predators. Another interesting result from this experiment was that the timing of seed sowing not only matters for seed emergence, but also for seeding survival and establishment. This figure here shows the time course of seedling survival after germination. It shows that seedlings from the earlier sowings in May and June had the best survival, probably because they were able to emerge early in the winter and have a long establishment period for the summer drought. So from this experiment, we've shown that fire season can affect seedling recruitment. However, we've still got some work to do to understand how these effects might interact with other aspects of fire, such as varying fire patchiness and severity in different seasons. For example, while we show that autumn might be the best time for post-fire seedling recruitment based on timing alone, autumn fires can be more severe and often leave fewer unburnt patches than spring fires. This just confirms how complex fire effects can be and that we need to do further research before making any definitive conclusions. Another important aspect of fire season effects is how well seeds might survive fire in different seasons. Ryan Tangy works on this on his PhD and found that seed moisture matters. This figure shows the lethal temperatures that can kill half of a seed batch under different moisture conditions for several banks of woodland species. First, we can see that these lethal temperatures increase down the list, showing that species might show varying sensitivity to high intensity fire. Secondly, we see that wet seeds generally have less resistance to fire temperatures than dry seeds. In the real world, this might mean that seeds might be at greater risk of death if they're burned during wet seasons or at times of the year when they're wet. The final part of our research that I'll talk about today is the issue of fire and invasive grassy weeds, something especially relevant to urban bushlands such as Kings Park. This graphic shows the grass fire cycle, where grassy weed invasion can lead to more frequent fire 
by changing fuel structures and because grasses generally dry out earlier in the fire season than co-occurring woody plants. In turn, more fire can select for grasses because they can rapidly re-sprout after fire and can take advantage of the post-fire environment to recruit new seedlings, causing a self-perpetuating cycle. So we set out to test these ideas and we're in the process of imposing fire and weed control treatments for some experimental blocks in Kings Park and Ballpark, as well as other urban bushlands in partnership with local councils. What we're seeing so far is that fire certainly does increase grassy weed abundance. However, fire followed by a rigorous weed control program can reduce grassy weeds, similar to herbicide treatments without fire. Recommendations based off this data would certainly suggest that post-fire weed control is crucial to help conserve the biodiversity assets in urban bushlands, as well as to reduce fire risks. We also looked at how fire and weeds can affect native species abundance and found that fire alone causes a normal post-fire peak in abundance, followed by numbers stabilising after a few years, something that we normally see following fire and bank signals. We also found that fire followed by weed control can lead to a large increase in native species abundance, especially where weeds were highly abundant before fire. The effect of herbicide only treatments varied and depended on initial weed abundance. So to summarize our fire ecology research here at Kings Park, one thing we're definitely seeing is that fire is a key ecological process in Banksy woodlands and it plays an important role in maintaining species diversity as long as fire regimes remain within the system's range of tolerance. We're seeing that focusing on plant democracy is a useful approach to study fire effects, and it can help us predict how future fire regimes might impact plant populations. Through a few experiments that we've run, we're seeing that fire seasonality can affect both seed survival through fire and post-fire seedling recruitment. However, we've still got more work to do to investigate interactions with fire patchiness, severity and intensity. We're also gathering some strong evidence for the importance of post-fire weed control to aid native species recovery. So thank you for joining into this webinar. As I said at the start, this is a pre-recorded talk, but if you do have any questions, you can leave them in the chat function of this webinar or feel free to email me. My email is on the screen now. Thanks very much.